Very good. I'd like, like to call this meeting to order. Uh, good evening, fellow commissioners and the general public. My name is Pete Sitnik. I am the vice chair of the Transportation Advisory Commission. Before we begin, please note that this meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to the county website and on YouTube. To conduct this meeting wholly electronically and to effectuate both the emergency procedures authorized by the new state legislation and FOIA, the Transportation Advisory Commission needs to make certain findings and determinations for the record. It is a bit cumbersome, so I ask you in advance for your patience. First, because each member of this commission is participating in a meeting from a separate location, we must verify that a quorum of members is participating and that each member's voice is clear, audible, and at the appropriate volume for all other members. I ask that each of you pay close attention to ensure you can both hear each of your colleagues. I am asking each commission, each commissioner, commission member, excuse me, participating in this meeting to state your name and location from which you are participating when I mention your name. At large, Linda Sperling. Hi, here. I am participating from my home in Clifton. Oh, excellent. Welcome, Linda. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Braddock District, Kevin Morse. Kevin Morse and uh, Burke. It's still Burke, isn't it? Why is this ever? Always has been. <laughs> okay. Uh, Drainsville District, Mike Champus. Uh, he's in Arizona. I don't think he's with us tonight. Um, Hunter Mill District, uh, Felicia Woods. Uh, she sent an email to Calvin and I earlier this, uh, this day. She attended the Silver Line, but she uh, opening but she had a work conflict afterwards, so she is not attending tonight. Uh, Mason District, Roger Hoskin. I am here in Mason District at the tip of the ice cream cone. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Mount Vernon District, uh, Pete Sitnik. Uh, sorry, I'm here from Mount Vernon. We're happy you're here, Pete. <laughs> uh, Lee District I'm is happy. still currently vacant unless someone walked in just now. Nobody there. Okay. Providence District, Jeremy Hancock. Jeremy Hancock in Falls Church. All right. Good to see you, Jeremy. This Spring the other end of the ice cream cone. <laughs> All right. Springfield District, Eric Thiel. Here in Fairfax Station. Oh, excellent. Uh, Sully District, uh, Mr. David Skiles. Absent. Fairfax Area Disability Services Board, Christy Garton. Hearing none, Christy's not here. At this point, I will pass a virtual gavel to Secretary Hoskins so that I may be heard to make a resequent motions. Thank you. I accept the virtual gavel and now recognize Commissioner Sitnik. I move that we have determined that each member's voice can be adequately heard by each other member of this commission. It is so moved. Commissioner Hoskin. You have heard the motion. Is there a second on the motion? Becca? Second. Okay, Jeremy. Uh, <clears throat> it is seconded by Commissioner Hancock. Is there a discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed, please say nay. Any abstention? Mr. Chairman, the motion is carried unanimously. I next move that the state of emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic makes it unsafe for this commission to physically assemble and unsafe for the public to physically attend any such meeting. I further move that this Commission may conduct this meeting electronically through a dedicated audio conferencing line and that the public may access the meeting by Microsoft Teams online platform or by dialing 1-571-429-5982 and entering the phone conference ID 373-730-387, pound. The phone number for ADA is 711. Access information is also available at the TAC website, 
www.fairfaxgovernment.gov slash transportation slash tax slash meetings. It is so moved. Is there a second to this motion? Second, Braddock. It is seconded by Commissioner Morris. Is there a discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please. Any opposed, please say nay. Are there any abstentions? Mr. Chairman, the motion is carried unanimously. Finally, I move that all the matters on this agenda previously furnished and posted on the TAC website are necessary for continuity in Fairfax County government and or are statutorily required or necessary to continue operations and the discharge of this commission's lawful purposes, duties, and responsibilities. You have heard the motion. Is there a second to this motion? Second, Braddock. It is seconded by Commissioner Morris Braddock. Is there a discussion on this motion? Hearing none, all of those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Are there any abstentions? Mr. Chairman, the motion is carried unanimously. Very, thank you very much, Roger. We will now start the tax business per the approved agenda. That's always such fun. Right. You did it well. Yay. <laughs> All right. Tonight's agenda, we we opened the meeting a little, couple minutes late. Uh, I'm skipping any chair's remarks at this time. Uh, I'll talk about something later on when all, all the rest of the commissioners talk. I need to welcome the public and the guests. Um, and we have a good number of them. We have two presentations tonight. So uh, we have VDOT here, FC dot, and I'm sure some that I don't know about at this moment. Um, we need to then move right on to acceptance of previous minutes. Uh, there was two minor edits that Kevin caught this afternoon. Uh, one was removing a word two from page three and uh, a question about should be is or are after one sentence. Um, <laughs> Kevin, since you did the, the little edits, um, would you like to move that they'd be approved as edited? I wasn't sure about my first one. I could never get that one right. I'm just, but spell check pointed it out. It's always a question what noun governs in the sentence, but uh, I'll leave it to the secretary. Thank you. And was the other one the singular or plural after data? It, it was whether the verb should be is or are, the uh, level of services. Services plural, the level is singular. Okay, that's right. The level of services. So the noun is level should be a singular. <clears throat> oh, I'll make those changes. Okay. We want to make that motion to approve the minutes as amended there, Kevin? Uh, so moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, excuse me, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, see, please by, signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? I'll Hearing abstain none. since I was out. What? I'll Pardon abstain me? since I was out. I was out last week time or last month, so I'll abstain. Okay, one abstention. Uh, hearing that, then it passes unanimously minus one. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Sorry, we couldn't have had a 20 minute discussion on is or are, but I, I think uh, that'll suffice. I think that was a good, good short brief one. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, on this one, I'd like very much to start right on with the, our very first presentation, and that's follow up on parking reimagined. Uh, Michael Davis, Land Development Services, and Willie Malin and Austin Gastral. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name right. I apologize. That's correct. 
Oh, I got it. Wow. OK, Department of Planning and Development. Um, good to see you again. I think I only saw you about a week ago. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, long time no see. <laughs> it's been a long time. Uh, but without any further ado, if you'd like to just jump into your presentation, that would be wonderful. Sure. Uh, I, good evening, everyone. We want to speak to you tonight about reimagining parking in Fairfax County. My name is Michael Davis, and I'm the project manager for the parking effort. My agency, Land Development Services, is teaming with the Department of Planning and Development on this project. Austin Gastrell from Planning and Development is co-presenting with me tonight. Parking has a profound influence in Fairfax County. With some exceptions, all land uses are required to provide parking. Driving remains a common activity and developers and property users feel obligated to provide it, even in places where it's not required. However, we must weigh the value of parking against other desirable community elements such as affordability, equity, the environment, site design, and economic viability. The need to provide more parking than necessary and meet confusing and restrictive regulations hinders the accomplishment of these goals. The current regulations place a higher importance on driving and parking than the possibility of repurposing excess parking to increase housing options. Regulations create challenges for startup businesses looking for affordable space when needing to meet paper parking requirements. The lack of flexibility creates lost opportunities to adjust development to preserve or enhance community space. Our presentation tonight creates an outline for an enhanced approach to parking regulation in the county. One that looks at the context of development as well as acknowledging that flexibility and predictability are important considerations for continuing our efforts for better, more compact land design, affordability, and economic growth. A primary goal of this project is right sizing parking requirements. This concept involves sizing parking to the average demand for it. This approach applies to all areas of the county from rural suburban to high intensity urban development. Because of these differences in character, different minimum parking requirements should apply. In lower density areas, we propose conventional approaches to parking, but want to avoid burdensome requirements. In medium density areas, we're accommodating innovation, but allowing conventional approaches. In higher density areas, we're pushing for innovation and discouraging conventional approaches. Overall, the next wave of development investment should involve less parking. If we meet the goal of right sizing parking requirements, then other important goals can be realized. Opportunities for better land stewardship occur, such as designing sites to exchange parking for community and green spaces. Less parking with better land design, access to multiple transportation modes, and a mix of uses dampens auto travel. From an administrative point of view, simplification and flexibility in our parking requirements is expected to create opportunities beneficial to the community. While we strive to right-size parking and requirements, we also know there are places and uses that present parking challenges. This project continues to evaluate options to address those issues. The Parking Reimagined project is intended to examine and adjust parking requirements and processes to provide community benefits. In our effort to create places where people want to be, autos and parking must have less influence in design. The Cap 1 site in Tyson's, the Mosaic District in Merrifield, and Reston Town Center are great examples where a walkable, compact, mixed-use urban design has taken precedence over street-oriented surface parking lots that create a vehicle golf between the roadway and the place you want to be. These main street and urban, rail and transit accessible places are as much a part of the county's fabric as low-density, tree-covered residential suburban development. Both places and the arc of development in between offer desirable characteristics for living, work, and entertainment. The county needs a balance to thrive, and this includes something as mundane as parking requirements. Our approach to parking seeks to acknowledge and respect the range of development within the county. Further, we want to diminish obstacles to business opportunities, meaning arcane parking requirements and rates designed for more car-centric activities of 30 to 40 years ago, constrains new business ventures, reinforces poor land and environmental management activities, and creates opportunity costs for uses that will provide community benefit such as more affordable housing. All of this helps the county succeed. We've created a proposed approach to parking that's depicted here. With the intent of right-sizing parking, this is particularly important where the densities and intensities of development allow for greater innovation and approaches. Thus, this map shows a concentration of areas subject to lower parking requirements. At least 90% of the county's land area would remain subject to baseline requirements with modifications. 
Lower minimum parking requirements are focused on areas defined in the comprehensive plan as growth areas. In this framework, the following tiers are proposed. Development in suburban centers is of relatively lower density, but the concentration of development within these areas provides opportunities for modest connectivity and shared activities that reduce parking demand. A 10% baseline reduction for commercial and multifamily development is proposed. Revitalization areas such as community business centers, commercial revitalization areas, and commercial revitalization districts are proposed for a baseline 20% reduction, which is consistent with today's standards. This includes commercial and multifamily development. Transit station areas and the Tyson's Urban Center are areas adjacent to transit-oriented development areas and are proposed to have a 30% baseline reduction. These areas are generally planned for higher density, mixed use development with good access to Metro Rail, as well as higher quality transit availability and a more walkable environment. Transit oriented development areas are proposed to have a baseline 40% reduction in minimum parking requirements. These are areas within one half mile of a Metro station and expected development will complement Metro Rail. Parking should be minimized to support the rail and transit investments and create a pedestrian scaled community. Planned Transit Tysons, also referred to as PTC zoning, are sites within the Tysons Urban Center that have been rezoned or have opted into PTC districts. The Tysons Urban Center is the county's downtown with the highest allowable densities. With acceptance of the PTC designation, property owners have low or no minimum parking requirements and maximum parking requirements. This project proposes to retain these criteria for the Tysons Urban Center. The parking rates and area reductions under consideration with this project affect minimum requirements. Caps on parking, known as maximums, are only proposed with development that chooses to opt in to no minimum requirement. This option would only be available in the Tyson's PTC and in transit-oriented development districts. With this project, we also anticipate establishing minimum bicycle parking requirements, which we'll get into detail a little bit later, as well as encouraging more EVC parking, and maintaining supplies of accessibility parking, even when the overall parking supply is reduced. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Austin. Thank you, Mike. The next few slides show examples of base or minimum parking rates being examined by this project. The existing single family attached dwelling or townhouse rate is 2.7 spaces per unit, with only one space having convenient access to the street. In response to concerns regarding lack of a, a lack of available visitor or shared parking in townhouse communities, we are proposing to alter or redistribute the existing single family rate by requiring that 0.2 of the total 2.7 spaces required per unit are provided for visitor or shared use. Reductions of the single family detached base rate are currently proposed in the TSA, TOD, and PTC districts. And just, just quickly to touch on this, we are not proposing to lower the parking requirement for townhouses. We are reallocating this rate in a way in which it would be requiring visitor or shared parking um, as a base rate, which is currently not done. So while the rate of 2.7 stays the same in a way, it actually acts in most cases as an increased parking requirement for single family uh, attached dwellings or townhomes. The proposed multifamily dwelling rate under consideration is between 1.3 and 1.6 spaces per dwelling unit. This is an example of parking rate right sizing. The Institute of Transportation Engineers maintains national parking demand data through their document parking generation. ITE's data shows that national average parking demand for suburban, non-transit served multifamily dwellings is 1.3 spaces per unit. Staff is also considering the possibility of proposing multifamily, uh, proposing a multifamily dwelling rate based on bedroom number and where applicable reductions of this rate uh, could be pursued. The proposed restaurant rate under consideration is between eight and 10 spaces per thousand square feet of gross floor area and between eight and 10 spaces per thousand square feet of outdoor seating area in excess of 1000 square feet. This is an example of rate right sizing and simplification. The size of a building or tenant space is a known factor throughout all phases of a project's lifespan. By transitioning to a single rate solely based on square footage, we can provide greater predictability for property owners and prospective tenants. The proposed retail sales rate under consideration is between two and five spaces per thousand square feet of gross floor area. This is an example of rate right sizing. Our current retail sales rate has not been updated since 1978. Since then, significant changes in shopping behavior have occurred, such as online sales, which have lowered parking demand. 
Local and national data shows that average non-December parking demand for all retail uses is below the current county requirement. I'd also like to take this time to say that the retail sales rate in front of you applies to a single standalone retail use. So think of a Walgreens that doesn't have a drive through um, any sort of commercial building that is only one tenant and, and doesn't have other tenants uh, located in that building. A building that has two or more tenants is considered a shopping center and is parked under the shopping center rate. Uh, the shopping center rate is also being proposed uh, to be updated and will be included in a future uh, white paper, which is actually coming out in a few weeks. And we'll touch on that uh, momentarily. Austin, um, one of the commissioners wants to ask you a question. Is Eric Teal? Yeah, hi. I just had a suggestion on the 0.2 spaces uh, per unit. Correct. I think you might want to put in some sort of roundup requirement on that so that people I believe can't, we do have one. You do? Okay. Because otherwise, you know, a developer could game the system a little bit by saying, well, there's really three things here and then getting the round off in their favor and arguing you should round it down. So I just yeah. said, I, yeah, I, I believe there I can let Mike address that later, uh, specifically regarding that administrative provision. But we, we are looking at different ways that um, that could impact the townhouse rate to include when rounding is appropriate. OK, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Austin. Yeah, no problem. So the example of this slide uh, shows how the proposed retail sales rate would transition or decrease through the tier framework. Uh, the minimum parking requirement or base rate would decline by 10% in the suburban centers, 20% in the revitalization areas, 30% in the transit station areas, and 40% in the transit oriented development areas. Uh, please note this project does not seek to change the maximum parking requirements which currently exist in the PTC district. Um, so again, as Mike had mentioned earlier, this, pro this project it's pretty much majority of this project looks at parking minimums. Um, the only place where we have maximums is in the PTC district where there's already maximums today. Or if you're going to be in a transit transit oriented development and you want to opt into the PTC parking rate. Now you could opt in through an administrative review, which would be a staff review, or you could opt in through a, something like a rezoning or an entitlement, um, which would again go to the board and it would be part of that hearing. So um, as such, maximums or caps on parking are only applicable in the PTC district and when in the TOD district someone decides to opt into the PTC rate. Everywhere else it's a minimum and you can park above the minimum. The existing office parking rate was last updated in 1988 when the three current rates were adopted. We are proposing to simplify this into two rates based on building size. The proposed office rate range under consideration for an office under 50,000 square feet is between 3 and 3.6 spaces per thousand square feet. The range under consideration for an office over 50,000 square feet is between two and three spaces per thousand square feet. Similar to retail uses, office parking demand has changed in the last 35 years. Remote working and flexible in-office schedules were becoming more commonplace prior to the pandemic, lowering average parking to need for offices. Further within the county, rail and bus transit services have expanded, providing travel alternatives, such as today with the Silver Line opening uh, up new stations. Uh, national survey data demonstrates that average parking demand for all office types is less than the current county requirement. This example shows how the parking requirement for an office over 50,000 square feet would translate through the tiered framework. The minimum parking requirement would decline by 10% in each tier, starting again in the suburban centers, to a 20% uh, in the revitalization areas, a 30% reduction in the TSA or transit station areas, and a 40% reduction in the TOD areas. This is also an example of rate right sizing. The proposed warehouse rate shown is an example of rate simplification. Many industrial uses have a parking rate based on number of employees or company vehicles, but a minimum of one space per thousand square feet of gross floor area. We're proposing to simplify this rate by basing it on the square footage of the building or number of employees, whichever is less. The size of a building can be determined at all phases of a project's lifespan and parking supply can be sized accordingly. Number of company vehicles is not constant, which can require excess parking to be provided. A requirement to provide additional parking can create hardships and prevent establishment of new businesses. Basing of the proposed rate on square footage or number of employee, whichever is less, also allows for flexibility to address specific needs of a business while also reducing conflicts which can arise when a new tenant proposes to take over an existing tenant space. So now I'll move on to bicycle parking. This is kind of our newest part uh, of the ordinance that we're proposing, what we've been working on recently. So as part of this project, we have worked with FCDOT to propose bicycle parking requirements as a new section of the zoning ordinance. Um, 
Bicycle parking would include minimum required bicycle parking rates, general provisions such as when bicycle parking is required, as well as locational and structural requirements for bicycle parking spaces, such as you know, distance from a door, um, our main entrance, uh, where they're located on the site, as well as structural requirements, such as the bicycles would need to be uh, supported in two places on a rack, things like that. Bicycle parking minimum requirements would be treated similar to vehicle parking by establishing a table of minimum requirements organized by land use classification. Bicycle parking rates for land uses and use classifications are proposed to be based on either a percentage of the required minimum vehicle parking or a set number of spaces. These requirements would also align with our proposed tiered framework by setting increased bicycle parking requirements in areas with denser development or in areas that are in closer proximity to public transit. This slide shows an example of land uses or use classifications, which could be subject to minimum bicycle parking requirements based on the percentage of required um, vehicle parking spaces, as well as how uh, this requirement would change for uses located in revitalization areas, TSAs, TODs, or the uh, Tyson's Urban Center. As a reminder, the rates shown are subject to change and a range of rates will be advertised. And I just like to step back to say all rates that we've shown you tonight um, are all subject to change. Nothing has been approved by the board yet or authorized by the board yet. And any rate that we do propose uh, will have a range associated with it for the board to determine what they believe to be the appropriate uh, rate. This slide shows an example of minimum bicycle parking requirements for industrial uses based on location and a specific number of spaces. So again, in this case, an industrial use such as a warehouse would be required two spaces per use, um, four spaces when located in a revitalization area such as the Richmond Highway Corridor or Richmond Highway CRD, and eight spaces per use when located in a TSA, TOD, or the Tyson's Urban Center. Again, adjusting per location um, and, and proximity to transit and going up when you're in, in higher proximity to transit. Um, since the kickoff of this project hey, in Austin, October, yes. Be uh, before you move from bikes, um, uh, I heard you saying you work with FC. Uh, I, I, I do not. We've been working, our group has been working with FC. That, that your group has been working with FC. Uh, do you know if they've been working with uh, the uh, Fairfax Alliance for Better Biking? Uh, because they might have some good information and help you guys yeah. do a better job yeah. on biking. Yeah, we have met with, uh, we met last week, Mike, with um, trails and sidewalks and had some conversations with different community members and, and different bicycle groups, as well as on our project work group. We do have a, I believe it's a FAB representative on that work group. We are proposing to have a bicycle parking um, open house here shortly um cool. to to kind of have a specific outreach related to parking and we've been uh working with nicole wyant uh in the fc dot who is their bicycle parking person um she is specifically working on an update to the 2014 or 2017 now guidelines for bicycle parking um and we have, have worked with her closely on this draft ordinance and the proposed rates and ranges thank you very much appreciate yeah. that yeah, no problem at all. So as I was saying, since the kickoff of this project in October of 2021, we've conducted nearly 60 project meetings, and really it's closer to 70 project meetings now, uh, which include supervisor-sponsored town halls, individual project meetings with all board members, as well as meetings with board advisory committees, community service groups, community association, industry groups, and internal county agencies to discuss and seek feedback on this project. Since January, we've met monthly with our community project work group to discuss elements of the proposal and gain their perspectives. These discussions have been important in modifying our proposals and framing our public discussions of them. Our initial public outreach efforts focus on values and rationales associated with the project. Our current phase of engagement is intended to give the community the ability to react and comment on tangible proposals. The updated project timeline before you shows our goal of bringing a completed proposal back to the Planning Commission and Board in early of 2023. In transitioning to our last, last slide regarding our project webpage, I'd like to take this time to say that November 22nd is kind of a big day for our project. Um, we are going back to the Land Use Policy Committee on November 22nd, which is a week from today, 
um, and we'll be releasing at that time a new white paper um, that will include all portions of our ordinance. It will include the administrative portions of our ordinance. It will include all the rates as well as bicycle parking that's in there as well. Um, so this is a, important for this project because it's a major milestone that we will get out a complete draft ordinance to the community to give the community the ability to react on that. Um, and so we'll have a comment period opened up during that time. Um, and I would highly suggest if you're interested in this project to, to keep an eye on our website as well as when you do see that come out. If you would like to give us comments, there's just ways on our website to get a hold of us. And also we'll be uh, using things such as public input um, to give the community the ability to comment on that entire draft proposal. Um, and then, like I said, our goal is kind of <laughs> early next year to go back to the Planning Commission, probably looking more like April, May timeframe as a finish line for this project. We've kind of extended that time frame. Bicycle parking did take us a while to kind of uh, get over a hurdle regarding uh, what we could do or couldn't do. Um, so that's pushed our timeline, but we do think that bicycle parking is important enough to push our timeline. So um, lastly, as stated, we have that project webpage of any information and opportunities to uh, participate in this project. And Mike and I would be uh, happy to answer any questions you may have tonight. Okay. Well, I'll jump in. Uh, in the multifamily housing, um, if it's typical or not typical, but let's say that that it's a three, generally a three bedroom uh, units. Um, and do you account for, um, you know, maybe a large number of rentals where all three uh, bedrooms are occupied by uh, 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 people that each have a car, so you have three cars per unit. Uh, I'll let Mike address the comment regarding multifamily. The current rate is intended to accommodate that ratio. Um, the, the rate, the base rate that we have um, is a unit based on a, a unit, which tends to be a little bit um, more broadly applied to um, multifamily development. There is another alternative, which Austin mentioned as part of the discussion, is looking at uh, a rate per bedroom, which would be more specific to account for um, the number of bedrooms within a multifamily development. Um, one of the things that we are going to be proposing it, with the latest release of information in the coming weeks is a bedroom rate for um, a number of the tiers uh, within the framework. But as Austin indicated, we've left open the possibility of looking at a bedroom rate across the board um, for uh, all the um, the base rate and all of the tiers. So um, that's where we are on, on, on that uh, circumstance with regard to bedrooms versus units. I, I just, I don't know, maybe there's a, a more English uh, version of that, but uh, if sure. it, I see in communities, you know, now multifamily where they they don't have enough parking, and it 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 does seem like you're multifamily, you're proposing to decrease that, whereas you know some existing communities would have preferred to have a higher uh, rate than than they have now. And I just like to mention that. Uh, majority of multifamily buildings are going to be subject to some sort of an entitlement or rezoning. So it is possible that that certain properties, I'm not saying that the, the current rate that we have is, is right or wrong in some instances or the rate in which they were developed, that was right. But um, the a lot of those existing multifamily developments are subject to something like a rezoning final development plan, which proffers or conditions the amount of parking. It is possible during that time that a multifamily dwelling may have asked to go under the minimum requirement, and that was something that the board would have acted on at the time. And so some of those are kind of hard to kind of pin down just because so many of them are subject to those entitlements, which may kind of fluctuate the actual parking on site. Well, and the other thing to add to that conversation is that as part of this project, we've been doing a lot of research on parking demand for multifamily, both using the parking generation manual as well as industry data and local data. There are some apartment complexes that are older that were subject to a lower parking requirement, lower than the proposed 
uh, unit rate that we are uh, that we've put out there. Um, and so they have been experiencing some parking problems, particularly with the higher bedroom units. Um, there have been some parking districts established to try to address that in for multifamily developments that are within single family communities. But that being said, the other information that we are getting and the uh, indicates that for multifamily development, a lot more people with one car families or one car, you know, either a single renter or a couple are gravitating toward multifamily. We've had a number of surveys within the county that indicate that parking demand for multifamily is consistent with what we're recommending and in fact is even lower. Um, there are a number of parking reductions that the board has approved, as Austin alluded to, that um, have, uh, you know, within transit areas, with uh, transit proximate areas uh, that are lower than the 1.3 that we're proposing as our base rate. So, and there have not been any problems associated with those developments and parking spillover. So, I think we're on the right track with regard to where we are um, with our recommendation um, based on a lot of the data that we're seeing. Yeah, I mean, I, in, in a dense area near transit, I, I, I could see the rationale, but in suburban area, uh, you, you haven't had in suburban area in your surveys, you'd be, you've not had much, much pushback to the lowering it. Um, a lot of those suburban areas that have multifamily that do have those issues are older development developments that are from the 60s, 70s, 80s, which were under parked at the time they were developed. Um, and so our newer development types and kind of what this would be impacting being new development, uh, we're, we're just not seeing some of those issues. And where, where does the uh, in that particular suburban area? Who benefits from the additional space? Does the developer get to put in more units or is there actual a bigger park put in? I'd well, FAR wouldn't change. And so floor area ratio, something like that, or, or a density requirement wouldn't change based on parking per se. Um, you still could be capped at a number. And again, a lot of it's going to be subject to that, that rezoning. Um, it could, in an instance where it could be multifamily, it could be that they may have more room um, to put in community amenities, pools, green space, things like that. Um, we're not currently requiring that any of that space get used for a certain thing, but it's kind of at that point, it's up to the developer to how they want to use that space. But it doesn't mean that they could increase above what current zoning ordinance requirements such as density would, would allow them. And my last question, you, uh, Walgreens was a good example, or I mean, something to focus on. Um, under the new rate, uh, what would you see the average, you know, at any given time of the day, if, if there's, I don't know, 10 spaces in front of the Walgreens, would you see, you know, eight or nine utilized? Uh, uh, and at some point during the day, do you see it at 110% utilization? Somebody doesn't get up space. Well, so, typically um, the Wal Walgreens and CVS, the, the, those are rightly identified as kind of a standalone retail use, one of the few standalone retail uses that we have in Fairfax County. And the requirement today, based on the average square footage of that of Walgreens or CVS, requires up to 80 parking spaces for that particular use. We've done extensive surveys both pre-COVID and even within the last year to follow up, you know, when things are been moving back to more, more normal activities with regard to parking and so forth. Probably, uh, I would say on average, about 20% of those spaces are used during various times of the day, what would be considered the peak hour of the use as well as during off times. Uh, so, it is a rare circumstance that more than half of those spaces would be utilized at any given time during the day for those uh, types of um, retail establishments. It is so the, the change would have minimal minimal effect in 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 a Walgreens CVS a standalone. Yeah. And yeah. So a, a lot of that, specifically for that use, kind of goes as well to changing human trends per se. So a lot, not not everyone, but a lot of 
pharmacy options now can be direct delivered to doors. Um, there's we do see kind of a decline um, in, in use of some of those those locations um, as well as um, like Mike said, really it is that that peak timing when you do see the most people coming in. Um, and, and as well, I would say that by adjusting that it, it as anything in this project, it's all kind of a, a seesaw impact. And so by adjusting that parking rate by maybe reducing some of that unused lo location, it does give the developer the opportunity at that point, again, have more green space, uh, possibly have other amenities on site, other uses on site, things like that that could be community serving. Thank well, you. it also provides the opportunity for more compact development in yeah. the sense that, you know, with these with these large expanses of parking, you know, there's a lot of distance between the parking lot and the street that is in front of that. And if you are using transit or if you're biking or walking, a lot of times you have to walk across a parking lot to get to the entrance to the building. And one of the things that we hope to achieve with this project as well is creating these situations where there's more street oriented activity. There's better access to the property from the street for these multimodal activities that are going on. So in addition to, you know, hopefully achieving some green and some environmental benefit, it's also more efficient use of land that we would be looking at. Yeah, I, I could see that. I just, I, and this is, and I'll end it there. I just was thinking of a, a stressed out parent coming in for an emergency prescription and, you know, maybe not finding a space at the peak hour and, uh, you know, adding to their level of stress. But it sounds like that that would be a pretty rare occurrence based on what you're seeing now. It, so. Yes. And the last thing I'll say kind of in response to that, um, as someone who's about to be a parent, um, is that <laughs> um, I, I think it's any developer is in, in any use as well. Uh, like I said, we're not really touching maximums. These are all minimums we're talking about, barring in those TOD areas or in the PTC. Um, is that it, a developer could always add more parking. And we're seeing that, and I see that specifically in my office in the ordinance administration branch, when we do things like zoning compliance letters, when a use comes in and says, hey, we're going to refinance, we're going to buy a property, we need to have information on it. We may say there's 100 spaces that are required, there are 80 spaces that are required there, but a certain person who is giving financing may say, you have to have X amount of spaces over that. And so regardless of a situation, there are plenty of opportunities and examples of when developers will park over that minimum because either they're required by financing or just the end user wants them to add more parking because they believe it fits their business model better. Thank you, and I hope as a new parent, you won't be making that trip too often. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. Are there any other pressing questions? Because if not, we can let these fo good folks go. Hearing none, um, Roy, thank you guys very much. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, uh, congratulations on being a new dad or that's fantastic. Uh, prize them, keep them close. Okay. Uh, you guys are welcome to stick around, but at the same time, if you just want to uh, slam the phone down and turn the computer off, go right ahead. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for that option. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and thank you all for your attention tonight. And um, certainly, if you if there are any other questions, follow up questions. Um, need for more information, uh, please get in contact with us or visit our website. Yep, and I dropped the website in the chat. Um, and, and like I said, November 22nd, um, if, if you're interested in this project, I highly suggest looking out for that new white paper and overall kind of completed package we're putting out to the community. And all this is available on your website. Thank you. Say that one more time. All of this is available on, on, on your website. Yes, it will be. It current the the updated version is not on there yet. It will be when we release it to the board on the twenty second. It, it, it also yeah. was it was shared before the meeting, so uh, we do have a copy of the presentation. So, so we got it. Thank you. All right. Have Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night. We're one minute ahead of schedule. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. That was interesting. It's, every time you see it, you learn something something new. Um, we, next up, we have Richmond Highway General Update. Um, that look like, looks like a familiar face there. AJ, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you, Pete? 
So who's going to lead things tonight? Dan is going to start off. All right, so. Uh, yeah, so th th thanks for part of the introduction there, Steve. Uh, Dan Reinhardt, is that so, right? Yep, I'm, I'm Dan Reinhardt. I'm with VDOT um, here for the Richmond Highway Corridor Improvements Project. And AJ, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, I'm AJ Hamidi. I'm with FX County Department of Transportation, and I work on the um, Richmond Highway uh, Bus Rapid Transit Project. Thank so, you both for being here and uh, let you guys run it and have fun. Thanks. Uh, so AJ and I are tag teaming this because they're one of the things we have for you tonight is talk about turn lanes and uh, the some of the analysis we're going to present tonight overlaps both of our projects. And so we figured we'd just join it into one big presentation. Uh, so we're here to talk about the Richmond Highway Corridor. And tonight we're going to go over an overview of the Richmond Highway Corridor Improvements Project, um, the BRT project. We're going to talk about the turn lane analysis that's recently been completed, uh, including some survey results and some recommendations. And we're going to go over some 12 month outlooks um, for the projects. And I'm going to lead it off with the Richmond Highway Corridor Improvements. So there's three initiatives that are currently uh, that are overlapping and interrelated on the Richmond Highway Corridor. So we have the MBAR Comprehensive Plan Amendment that sets the overall vision for the Richmond Highway Corridor. Uh, we have the VDOT administered roadway widening project from Jeff Toddway to Sherwood Hall Lane. And then we have uh, the BRT project that's being administered by Fairfax County through FCDOT that extends all the way from Huntington Metro down to Fort Belvoir and actually overlaps the widening project. And we got a couple of graphics as we go through the presentation that hopefully will explain the interplay of the two projects. But I'm going to kick it off with the smaller of the two projects with the Richmond Highway Corridor improvements being administered by VDOT. So as I mentioned, it's it's roughly three miles from Jeff Todd Way to Sherwood Hall Lane. Uh, we are going to the widening project, as we call the Richmond Highway Corridor Improvement Project, is covering some safety improvements, um, such as additional lanes to reduce congestion, providing crosswalks and bike and ped facilities. Uh, we're going to be doing intersection improvements. We're going to be relocating several intersections. We're going to be teeing some skewed intersections up to make them safer. Uh, we're going to be providing a wide median throughout this three mile section of Richmond Highway to accommodate the future BRT that AJ will talk about in a few minutes. We are providing sidewalks and, and separate cycle tracks on both sides of the road. Uh, we're providing three bridge replacements at Doe Creek, North Fork of Doe Creek and Little Hunting Creek. There is the potential for noise walls in the corridor. Um, we are going to be relocating utilities overhead to overhead, and we are going to be providing stormwater management as part of the project. And the Richmond Highway Corridor Improvements Widening Project is, as I said, three miles. It is being broken up into two phases. So phase one is roughly a mile and a half, and phase two is just a little over a mile and a half, and they're broken just north of Fry Road. So for the widening project, this is the typical section that will be implement or you will see at the end of the project. So we have a wide median for future BRT. We have three general purpose lanes in each direction, along with left turn lanes where appropriate. We have buffer green space behind the curb to provide a buffer and provide landscape opportunities. We have an eight and a half foot cycle track. Actually, I'm sorry, this is an old graphic. This is showing single direction cycle tracks, but we have bi-directional cycle tracks on each side of the roadway. We have a green buffer behind those cycle tracks to, for a place to put the utilities. Um, and then we have a six foot sidewalk on each side of the roadway. So just as a quick overview of where we are now and some of the ongoing activities, we are coordinating with citizen, uh, the citizens through several media uh, venues. We are attending Mount Vernon Council of Civic Associations meetings when in, when Pete invites us. We are looking are in uh, attending town hall meetings hosted by elected officials. We're attending Chamber of Commerce meetings. 
Uh, and if someone in the community would like us to, we are more than happy to come out and, and do presentations. We are incorporating design adjustments from internal external comments received on the project to meet state and local requirements. Um, we are communicating with third party developers. So when a developer comes in to uh, redevelop a parcel, we are meeting with them uh, to make sure that we're on the same page as to how the property gets developed and how it relates to the new roadway. Uh, we have reached out to utility companies on both phases of the project, and we are we have received utility easement information on phase one, and we are uh, working with them on on acquiring all the information for phase two right now. Uh, total right away acquisition, so anywhere we need to acquire an entire entire parcel, those acquisitions have been authorized uh, for us to proceed. We currently have fourteen pro properties already acquired. Uh, the right of way for phase two, we are anticipating authorization to move forward with that early next year. Uh, and I know you guys are being provided with a copy of the presentation. The website is here uh, on this slide for future information. And now I'm going to hand it over to AJ to talk about the BRT. I've got a real quick question for me right during this transition. There's a kind of a throwaway line there where you said you're doing overhead to overhead, and the graphics show that. Too. Is there any reason why those utility lines aren't being buried? Is that is there a technical reason, or I'm just not doing it? Because it seems to be the trend in the county to try to bury utility lines. And that may uh, be not in your wheelhouse, but I can try. Hey, to Eric, Eric just popped yeah, up, so ahead. maybe I'll let Eric take this. I'll go and answer. It's um, primarily been a cost issue. Okay, that's a good reason. Yeah, and and it's a pretty high cost. Roger, it was well debated uh, at, uh, to a uh, standstill, and the board just recently made that decision. So it's a done deal. It's going to be overhead, overhead. I, I don't know why they're making such a big deal about trying to bury all these lines, but it, no. it seems to be kind of the trend. Anyway, I thought when you had everything torn up like that, burying it would be easier, but you're saying that's not the case. So we'll go with the low cost solution. I like that. Carry on. <laughs> All right, um, moving on to the uh, broader uh, BRT project. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. OK, so for those that aren't familiar with this um, a massive project, the Richmond Highway uh, uh, Bus Rapid Transit Project, BRT project, is an effort to plan, design, and construct a BRT system from the Huntington Metro Rail Station all the way to Fort Balfour. Uh, there are nine potential uh, BRT stations planned within the system, and the uh, system will be constructed in two phases. And in the graphic on the right, you can see that there is a, a, a section in orange which is phase one uh, or section one, and then the blue section is um, is the second phase, uh, and then the blue phase, uh, which is the second phase, is also also overlaps with the Richmond Highway widening project. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, so this is um, a uh, evolution of the cross section. Uh, so you you had seen earlier. Um, the Richmond Highway uh, widening projects cross section, which shows the wide median, median along with the six through lanes and the um, the two way cycle track and sidewalk. Um, this uh, uh, graphic um, shows the um, the uh, the transit way, the BRT transit way that is going to run in the median. There's going to be two lanes, uh, one northbound, one southbound with um, two medians on either side of the transit way for uh, landscaping. And those uh, medians would also convert to uh, BRT uh, station platforms. And uh, you can see on um, the graphic that's uh, hovering above the um, the main graphic, um, the left turn lanes would uh, eat into one of the medians um, to in order to, at the intersections in order to allow the left turn movements and the U turn movements. Um, but other than that, the cross section would be uh, identical. Um, for the uh, for the VDOT project in terms of the bi-directional cycle track, the six foot sidewalks and the landscaping panels. The graphic here 
um, uh, shows some trees, which will definitely be included, but um, don't um, assume that this is a perfect depiction of the landscaping because the landscaping will the landscaping will be pretty elaborate uh, and will um, it's this was just for illustrative uh, purposes. Um, so moving on. Uh, so just to give a design update uh, where we, uh, where we where we stand with the BRT project now, the design is approximately 60% complete. Um, we have roll plots available on the Fairfax County website. Um, you just um, can go on any search engine and, and look at Richmond Highway uh, BRT, and you can uh, go to the um, the county, uh, the Fairfax County website, and uh, uh, go under Project Materials on the on the left hand side, and then you can delve into the roll plots and go into uh, specific sections. Um, we uh, recently received good news from the um, from uh, the Federal Transit Administration. Um, and with regard to the National Environmental Policy Act, we've been granted a categorical exclusion on the NEPA review process back in January. So that was a critical milestone that allows the project to move forward. Um, the other, uh, another critical uh, milestone was that um, we had a presentation back in April where we depicted uh, the intersection improvements um, up uh, in the North Kings Highway uh, slash uh, Shields Avenue area of the project, and we depicted how we're going to um, uh, uh, the lay of the land, so to speak, for that section of the BRT project. Um, we have also we have also concluded the branding effort for the project. Um, the BRT system is going to be called the One. Um, it's a a name that's uh, that resonated with the community and is uh, simple to remember and and um, and relates to the route one um, uh, uh, name for the for the for the corridor. Um, there has been also a community charm outreach and mini uh, mini meetings um, that were held uh, throughout the summer. And for those that aren't familiar with community charm, um, essentially um, it's an effort to create themes um, and uh, graphics uh, for the various stations so to make uh, to, to basically customize um, uh, some of these uh, BRT stations with uh, uh, with the community. So uh, a theme might be, uh, for instance, um, uh, for Gum Springs, it might be the historic nature of Gum Springs and the ties to the African American community. Um, or for uh, for Lockheed, there might be a tie to the to the airfield or are so on and et cetera. So each of these uh, stations has been associated with a particular theme. And then um, we are meeting with um, uh, 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 the high, members of uh, three public high schools uh, and um, uh, community, uh, teenage community centers with the National um, Neighborhood and Community Services um, to basically get artists to do renderings that will be on the windscreens of the BRT station platforms. Um, so that's that's going to continue. So the um, we did it, some initial work. Uh, community charm is not done, uh, but um, that is uh, kind of a two prong um, approach to to try to uh, you know customize some of these uh, BRT stations. Uh, another uh, critical development on the BRT project was that um, with VDOT concurrence, we were able to uh, lower the design speed for the corridor from 45 miles per hour to 35 miles per hour. So um, just for everyone's clarity, the distinction is uh, from design speed and posted speed limit is the posted speed limit is what is out there today. The design speed is what um, we're designing the geometric features of the project based on. So the design speed is 35 miles per hour. There is a separate ongoing initiative to study the speed limit, the posted speed limit for earlier um, design uh, uh, speed change. Uh, and that I think is being led by VDOT. Um, there's also a third party, a third party coordination going on with Fort Belvoir, uh, with WMATA, with respect to the Huntington Metro Rail Station, and of course with VDOT, um, with maintenance and um, and other matters. Uh, on the utility coordination is ongoing as well. Uh, next slide. Um, in addition to um, the community charm, there's also a station renaming outreach effort. Um, so essentially, there had been some feedback from the community um, that the uh, the uh, pub, uh, the board of supervisors uh, members uh, noted that um, they wanted to um, have a better connection with some of the um, some of the station naming uh, efforts. Um, so uh, Penda, um, Hybla Valley, and Gum Springs are undergoing um, an effort to uh, pick a 
uh, more appropriate or suitable uh, uh, station name. So that's uh, that's continuing. Um, we are also coordinating with VDOT on the sound wall um, uh, uh, on sound walls. Um, so that um, is an ongoing effort. Uh, the going back to station naming, um, the final decision needs to be rendered by December uh, of this year. So we should have um, some progress uh, fairly soon on the final names for those three particular stations uh, that we are studying. Um, there's also um, uh, we're also entering FTA uh, engineering phase, and that's anticipated in January of, the, of next year. Um, there's also a uh, Federal Transit Administration project writing process, and that um, is anticipated in March of 2023. Um, the next milestone with respect to the actual engineering designs is 90%, so we would be going from 60% to 90%, and uh, we're anticipating that the 90% um, stage will be reached in June of next year. Um, there are ongoing efforts to do the right-of-way acquisition, land acquisition, and demolition. Um, and of course, as we already mentioned, there is the third third party coordination with, um, in addition to Fort Belvoir, uh, WMATA, VDOT, there's also the land development um, coordination that VDOT's doing on its side. We have to do the same thing in particular on the uh, first section, the upper section of the uh, BRT project. And utility coordination is also uh, another critical uh, uh, element of this um, uh, next uh, 12 months. So moving on to the next slide. OK, so now um, we're going to delve a little bit more into um, the world of turn lanes um, and, um, and 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 give you some details on uh, what's um, emerged on that front. So first, let me provide a little bit of background. Um, when the BRT project was endorsed by the Board of Supervisors, um, the Board of Supervisors directed uh, staff to evaluate potential design changes to narrow the cross section of Richmond Highway, and there were multiple reasons for doing that, um, one of the key reasons was improving bicycle and pedestrian safety, um, improving BRT operations and, and vehicular operations, and some of these elements are related. Um, if you improve one, you improve the other, and so forth. And how the various um, uh, users of the um, of the infrastructure would interact with one another, uh, intersection operations would be improved, and corridor operations uh, would be enhanced. So we looked at 13 intersections. Um, if for potential left and right turn lane reductions. Um, we coordinated our work with VDOT, of course, and um, we provided the results of our, um, or at least our initial results uh, were presented in uh, on May uh, 3rd at a public meeting. We provided um, a recommendation to uh, remove or modify 12 out of 13 potential changes. And also we recommended um, off street, uh, future off street parking for two uh, intersections. Uh, next slide. Uh, as part of, as part of this turn lane study, we conducted an online survey uh, to receive feedback from the public, and the comment period was from May third to May thirty first of this year. We received uh, a pretty robust uh, level of response. There were 430 responses overall. Not everyone responded to every single question. It was a pretty lengthy survey because we went through the entire 30, uh, 13 intersections. Uh, about 200 or to 250 people responded um, for any particular um, modification at an intersection. The surveys were multilingual. Uh, they were provided in both English and Spanish. Uh, uh, online and on paper during the public meeting. And um, the general consensus was from the survey results that um, the public agreed with um, the staff's recommendations uh, for the for the various modifications. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, following the uh, May 3rd public meeting, uh, we presented our recommendations uh, coupled with the survey results to the uh, the Richmond Highway uh, BRT Executive Committee. Uh, that was on June 10th. And um, the BRT Executive Committee uh, agreed with all but three of the recommendations, and they requested additional study for um, the southbound right turn lane at Beacon Hill, the southbound right turn lane at North Buckman, and the eastbound right turn lane at Sacramento Drive. So we did a follow-up work, additional uh, uh, analysis, uh, field observations, 
uh, and uh, then presented our uh, additional uh, uh, study results to the BRT Executive Committee on September 28th. And that's where the BRT Executive Committee approved the final three uh, locations. Next slide. Um, so in the following slides, uh, we have a summary of the uh, all potential uh, location, uh, all the potential modifications. There were originally 30, but um, after the the June uh, BRT Executive Committee meeting, uh, Supervisor Lusk um, wanted us to see if we could uh, make a, an additional modification by adding a crosswalk on the north leg of the uh, Richmond Highway at North uh, Buckman slash Mount Vernon Memorial Highway intersection. So the uh, denominator increased from 30 to 31. So um, we then we essentially studied 31 modifications. The the uh, the results um, were that we increase the number of modifications by two. And uh, we retain the number of recommendations for off street parking, uh, and that would be two uh, two locations. And the, the I, I won't go um, on each one of these uh, uh, results uh, on the table, uh, but we will be going graphically intersection by intersection on the affirmative modifications. So um, here uh, you just see the, the various intersections, uh, both the, um, the intersections that were modified and those that uh, uh, were not. So uh, moving on uh, to, the, uh, to the first of, inter of, the, of the various intersections where we, are, um, we've, uh, we have approval uh, for a modification. The first one is uh, Shields Avenue at Richmond Highway. Uh, this is at the north end of the BRT uh, project. We are planning to remove the southbound uh, right turn lane from Richmond Highway onto Shields Avenue. Uh, so that is one modification. We are also planning to um, reduce the median width on the north leg of that intersection. The original median was um, considerably larger, and we've made geometric improvements in order to uh, in order to uh, reduce that median width and reduce the pedestrian crossing distance for those on the north leg of that intersection. Uh, in addition, we um, made some modifications that were presented back um, in May. It's not new, but um, uh, the portion of the BRT transitway system between the Kings Crossing um, intersection and the Shields Avenue intersection um, is not going to have uh, two lanes of exclusive BRT lanes. Uh, one of the lanes, um, the southbound direction for BRT is going to be running in mixed traffic. And the reason for that is there was considerable right away um, uh, cost savings and uh, building impacts that we could be spared by um, by essentially having a very a short one uh, segment, one block segment uh, of BRT run in mixed traffic. So just uh, south of this graphic, the BRT goes back into exclusive, uh, the exclusive transit way. Uh, so I did want to note that. Um, next slide. Could you could you just hold up a second there? Because sure. I I did look at this earlier, and I, when I got to the to these maps, I was just completely lost. Um, and then I didn't realize. Uh, so what's that like? You're in a you're in a dedicated lane, and then all of a sudden you're not. Um, so merging traffic coming in front of you and. So what will happen is, um, for, for at least for the northbound left turn movement, it's ex it's exclusively in uh, a transit uh, lane on Richmond Highway. Then it um, then there is a um, a basically a head start that the signal gives to the BRT vehicle uh, before it gives the green the left turn green arrow for the general purpose lane. So the northbound left uh, transit way um, user, the BRT uh, operator gets a head start when it making when making that northbound left. And then the rest of the northbound left turn uh, traffic, the car, the cars uh, make the left. Um, so that's how uh, we uh, make the operations work out for the for that portion on the southbound side or the eastbound side when you're coming back um, from Huntington and North uh, North Kings um, essentially um, the 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 but uh, the BRT transit vehicle is going to be making a left turn vehicle make a left turn uh, mixed with the regular um, vehicles and 
uh, connector buses and everybody else. So um, it would then use, um, it would then enter the left turn lane of the King's Crossing intersection, which is just uh, south of this graphic. It's cut off a little bit. Um, but at the next intersection south of, of where we're seeing this um, graphic, um, it, it would also be given an op opportunity to uh, turn into the median. So um, it, it, essentially, the, the signals help to, uh, to um, uh, allow the BRT uh, to operate within this uh, mixed zone. I hope hopefully that verbally makes sense. It's a little it's a lot of a lot of jargon to try to explain that. Yeah, I I know on our Braddock Road multimodal project at some point they uh, they had actual simulations where you could you know and so I don't know if you're at that point yet, but if you do get to that, I'd I'd like to see it. Um, I I didn't even know that the I thought the BRT was a straight shot. You're making a hard left at on Shields. So the BRT is a straight shot from Fort Belvoir um, all the way um, to Shields Avenue. So that is almost, I think, six miles. Uh, but then um, it has to um, it has to deviate from Richmond Highway in order to reach the Huntington Metro Station. So uh, right um, north of Penda, um, that little segment from um, north of Penda um, to Huntington Metro, it has to deviate from Richmond Highway. So uh, essentially at Shields Avenue, um, it goes on to Shields Avenue, uh, then on to North Kings Highway, and then North Kings Highway takes it to the Huntington Metro. So I'm not sure if that's uh, maybe a mile or so of the seven and a half miles of the project, but uh, it's a it's a small uh, subset of the of the total uh, uh, system. Okay. So, one thing to point out here is that it looks like a straight shot, but actually Richmond Highway comes this way. Hopefully you can see my cursor. Okay, yeah. So I Richmond do. Highway goes that way, and so we're okay. making a hard left here and coming up to Huntington Metro. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. In that, uh, that graph uh, that we were looking at, were you uh, the first thing you did eliminated a right turn lane? What What's the impact of that? I mean, does that... It seems like a, a negative. So the, uh, for the sake of, um, of our time constraints, we didn't include all of the background technical uh, analysis that we conducted to reach these conclusions. There was considerable uh, work in terms of looking at intersection delay, uh, movement delay, and uh, queuing lengths to see what was tolerable and what wasn't tolerable. And we also looked at um, our volumes, the number of turns um, in, a, in the peak hours. So um, when we made these recommendations, generally speaking, um, when the queues were fairly short, when the volumes were um, the deltas or the change in volume and the delays were minimal and where the volumes were fairly low, um, we deemed uh, we 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 granted the reduc the reduction in the left in the in the right turn lane. So um, essentially, yes, there is some sacrifice in terms of um, in terms of delay. Uh, but we are um, uh, what we're doing though is uh, we're improving the experience for the pedestrians and cyclists, uh, reducing pedestrian crossing distances, uh, in, uh, in often in areas where there is a BRT station. Uh, so we're um, trying to make this more multimodal and one particular movement might um, have a, a little bit higher delay and a little bit longer queue. Uh, but overall, we're um, we're improving the uh, experience for other modes of travel. It, it's incumbent on the driver, though, then to signal, right, that he's going to make that right turn. Correct. The, what would happen is that the rightmost lane would be a shared through right lane and they would have to signal. Um, they would use their uh, a right turn signal um, when they're when making that uh, southbound right turn movement. Well, fingers crossed. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. OK, so um, I think we went to the Furman Lane uh, location. This um, at Furman Lane, um, what we were asked to study was whether um, uh, essentially what you see in green in, in the green area, the green median, um, uh, was originally a uh, receiving lane. It was a fourth uh, lane on the on that uh, north side of the road of Richmond Highway. And what we were asked to do was if uh, we could uh, tolerate turning that 
fourth receiving lane into a uh, grass median. And uh, we deemed it acceptable from an operations and BRT and 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 various uh, other metrics. We deemed it was ex it to be acceptable to convert that uh, fourth lane into a grass median. Next uh, slide. Uh, the next intersection is Southgate. Um, so uh, based on a similar analysis of, of queuing delays uh, and observations and volumes, uh, we determined that the southbound Richmond Highway right turn lane um, uh, the, the can be uh, eliminated and then the uh, rightmost lane would be converted into a shared through right lane uh, at this intersection. So we, we found that it was a it was something that we can accommodate uh, for the benefit of, um, of the pedestrian cyclists and other modes. Uh, and then another intersection is um, Beacon Hill. Uh, we uh, there were two changes that were studied at this intersection. One was um, the northbound right turn lane onto Beacon Hill, and the other was the southbound right turn lane um, from Richmond Highway onto Beacon Hill. And um, we deemed both of those um, to be acceptable uh, changes. Uh, the elimination of both of those um, right turn lanes has been uh, recommended and adopted. Uh, so uh, I will note that the southbound right turn lane has uh, um, a fairly significant queue. Uh, and there are some conditions that we are working out with VDOT in terms of um, in terms of monitoring the queuing and delay situation with respect to that southbound right turn lane in the future once the um, the project is uh, built. Uh, so um, uh, so that's an ongoing effort to make sure uh, that um, the that the operations um, doesn't um, deteriorate. Uh, but um, uh, we we have concluded that we can um, we can do a balancing act and remove that right turn lane. Uh, especially uh, given that this is at a, a BRT station. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then uh, for Memorial Street, um, we studied whether or not the eastbound right turn lane could be removed. Uh, what we found was that the the queuing would be uh, intolerable. It would be excessive and during the peak hours. So um, we don't recommend um, we don't recommend um, eliminating that eastbound right turn lane. However, the Embark Comprehensive Plan Amendment does call for future on-street parking along Memorial Drive. So um, what we're planning to do is to have the eastbound right turn lane uh, remain uh, for potential future use uh, for both um, for the right turn movement and for time of day parking. So that there's the potential for off street, uh, off off peak on street parking, uh, for that eastbound right turn lane on Memorial Street. And, and that Next last slide. slide, when you when you when you said you uh, eliminated the right turn lane with conditions, what did you did you mention what those conditions were? So it, it's it, there's a um, a number of conditions that BDOT and 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 the county are working. Uh, together um, on it's one is um, uh, queue length. That's a particular um, uh, uh, concern. We want to make sure that the queues do not become uh, too uh, excessive, um, and that would be um, a condition where we're uh, monitoring both. Uh, uh, we're monitoring the right turn movement to see if. Um, the uh, the queue exceeds a particular threshold, and we're working with VDOT to see what is an appropriate threshold, uh, essentially to trigger the need for the uh, construction of, of that right turn lane. So, uh, at some point, if if the if the queue becomes too onerous uh, for that movement, um, we may um, uh, construct the right turn lane. We are setting aside the right of way needed to to build that right turn lane with the BRT project, so that's another condition. So it's not as if um, we would um, re-engage on the right of way acquisition land acquisition process to do it. So it'd be that that step would be saved in the in the process of doing a a right turn lane. But queuing is probably the most important one, and we also are um, negotiating on um, how long we monitor that queue. Um, so um, uh, 
which, which or we, there would be a, um, a sunset clause in terms of how many years we'd be studying that uh, the operations of that intersection uh, and, and um, uh, after which we would we would just leave it as it is. OK, so you, you've left flexibility. The right turn lane may or may not be in the final uh, design. OK, right. So as it currently stands, it's not. And there is um, the ability to add it with uh, with with without too much um, onerous um, steps, essentially. Okay. OK, thank you. All right, so um, we went to Memorial and then for Memorial we are. Um, I think I'll be I'll be handing it over back to Dan um, to cover the VDOT portions of the corridor. Thanks, AJ. So this gets back into uh, the VDOT widening, the VDOT administered widening project. So BRT extends uh, basically from Sherwood Hall north for their phase one and their phase two goes to the south, but the south is also included in the widening project. Um, there was originally a turn lane, a southbound turn lane dedicated to going into the Costco parking lot. Uh, so we determined that um, the the volumes allow us to remove that right turn lane. So that, that has been in or, uh, we have decided to remove that turn lane. And then one of the conditions um, that currently exists is there's dual left turn lanes into the Walmart Costco parking lot. Uh, we've determined that the the queue lengths uh, and the operations will allow us to remove one of those uh, turn lanes, thereby narrowing this crossing distance for pedestrians and limiting their exposure. So if I go further south to Ladson Lane, so Costco is right here. North is up in all of these graphics. Ladson comes in with eastbound traffic. Currently, uh, the design shows two dedicated left turn lanes and a dedicated right turn lane. Uh, we determined that the queues are acceptable uh, if we remove this right turn lane uh, and have a dedicated left and a dedicated right turn lane at Latson Lane. Were you surprised at all that you could do that? I, I thought Costco had pretty high utilization, you know, people coming in. And, I mean, I'm not a member, but every time I drive by one, it seems pretty full. So it's interesting when you talk about something like Costco, the the uses a lot of times are highest on the weekends when the peak traffic everywhere else is lower. And don't get us wrong, in a lot of these scenarios, there is a penalty to a price to be paid. The, the queues do extend, there is more delay, but both the BRT and, and VDOT both agree that the the delays caused by these improve or changes are not excessive. OK. So and then we move down further uh, to the Mount Vernon Buckman intersection. So uh, Buckman on the left, Mount Vernon Highway on the right. Um, starting from the, the eastbound side here, uh, we've determined that we can remove the through left turn lane. We can combine this uh, what's currently shown as the middle lane to be a left through right that will run at the same time as this dedic dedicated left. Um, the uh, northbound left turn lane actually was shown, in a lot of cases it was shown for symmetry. Um, it's really the north side of this intersection that's driving the width. So this turn lane was provided, but it actually has a very low number of users. So we. Uh, this wasn't even something we were asked to look at, but it's something that we, as we were doing this analysis, we determined we can actually remove this northbound left turn lane. Um, and then the dedicated right turn lane was something that we were asked to look at, and we do feel it is appropriate to remove that dedicated right turn lane. Do you see a lot of examples of uh, um, a lane where you can go uh, three directions, left, straight, or, or right? Is that is that common? Um, it's not necessarily unusual. Uh, it just one of the the drawbacks to not having a dedicated right is that if you have somebody that's making a right, they get stuck behind people making the through and the left turn. Yeah, um, and so that that is going to increase the queues along Buckman Road uh, for people who could be making that right potentially unread. But again, as we look at, I, I guess 
there is a little bit of queue lengthening as a result of this, but one of the other things is it keeps people from making, from making a write on red, which in some cases is in conflict with pedestrians who are trying to cross this leg of the intersection. Um, so it, it's a trade off. You get some pedestrian benefits to not having a dedicated right turn lane with a right turn on red, uh, but there are drawbacks and that that traffic cannot flow uh, when they're stuck behind somebody trying to make a left or a through. And there, all right, and just to, I think, reiterate what you said, there's no, um, th there'll be no right on red at that, in, in that lane. Um, I don't know that we are going to sign it, no right turn on red, but as soon as you get somebody making a left or a through movement, it's just not an option anymore. Okay. Does that make sense? It, well, it, it, I mean, if you're, if you're up at the intersection, the guy in front of you has made a left and you, you're going to make a, uh, and then the light turns red. So it's to be determined whether it'll be prohibited or not to make the right on the red. Uh, my, I do not believe that we are planning on signing this as no right turn on red, but as soon as somebody comes, so likely the first person that wants to make a left will queue up in this left lane. Yeah. But then as soon as somebody queues up in this right lane that wants to go through or left, no one else can make a right turn on red. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So it's, in some respects, it's almost like a de facto no no right turn on red. I, I see where you're going. But okay. if everybody lines up here wants to make a right, I, I think that we will permit that. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. And then I believe my last. Int oh, so there's one other thing uh, AJ alluded to with when we went back to the BRT executive committee after stuttering, studying these intersections. Supervisor Lux, Lusk asked us to take another look at providing a pedestrian crossing on the north side of this intersection. Uh, and historically, this has been problematic because we have traffic running through this leg of the intersection in every phase of the signal. So we are looking at an option of kind of trying to segregate these two right turn lanes further north, providing an island in here to allow this a crossing of Richmond Highway. Uh, we are currently drawing up some concepts for that um, so that we can get crosswalks on all four legs of this intersection. Was it Supervisor Lusk or Supervisor uh, Stork? Is it at, at this point, it, do you remember? I, I believe in the executive committee meeting, it was brought up by Supervisor Lusk. Okay. Is that, that's an interesting concept of moving uh, the two right lanes over. Okay. Yeah, Thank so you. I mean, he wasn't the one who suggested that alternative. He was he was pushing us to get the uh, to find one. Yeah, <laughs> find one. Yes, yes, find a solution. Okay. Thank you. All right, and I think this is my last intersection I'm going to go through. So we were asked to look at removing this right turn lane um, at uh, eastbound Sacramento Drive. Um, it when we removed that right turn lane, it, it did significantly increase the queues. The queues started to back up and conflict with the entrances to the shopping centers on either side. Uh, so we determined that we would not remove this turn lane. Uh, however, as, similar to Memorial Avenue in the comprehensive plan, it, it does show on street parking um, for Sacramento Drive. Uh, and so we're going to leave this lane in place for peak hour uh, with the anticipation that it could be dual purposed for uh, off peak on street parking as well. <clears throat> All right, and so just to reiterate something AJ said earlier, so of the 31 modifications we were asked to look at, we've uh, 14 of them have been approved by the BRT Executive Committee. Uh, and the, both the design teams for the BRT and VEDA are both incorporating the changes that we've gone over tonight into the plans. Um, and I, that's the end of our presentation. So we'll turn it okay. over to you guys if you have questions for us. Um, After you, Eric. Go ahead. Was it Eric? Who thought it was? No, um, I don't have any questions. All right. Well, I've got a, I have a couple. Um, did, does the um, 
putting the design speed in at 35, doesn't that force the issue of the posted speed to be 35? It, it does not necessarily force the issue. Um, however, there is a design, a parallel effort of a speed study on Richmond Highway um, that is looking at and has actually recommended a 35 mile an hour design or posted speed for Richmond Highway starting sooner than these projects would go forward. So yeah. the, 35, the 35 mile an hour design speed may be already be in place. OK, yeah, I mean, I know there's been a lot of discussion on that and it seemed like it was headed that way, but. The way you discussed it earlier, it, it, I, it, I just thought when you if you're doing a road project and. It's designed at 35 that maybe it automatically follows that the post it would be 35, maybe not. I don't, you know, road projects around the country. I don't know how that works, but that that occurred to me. It is not always the case, but when the, that decision was made, I think that was the intention is that the posted speed would be lowered as well. Um, yes. And uh, we're we're hopeful that the final conclusion, the final report of that uh, speed study is uh, finalized shortly and that it will be changed before the projects even get there. OK, um, early on, you mentioned uh, uh, AJ mentioned renaming we're are, are are any of the names that are out there now or intersections are they objectionable i don't i, I don't know the area real well but um was that was that a problem um i would um i wouldn't say there was any objection there was some interest from the gum springs community to possibly switch uh the gum springs you have high blue valley and then just below that Gum Springs, there was some talk about maybe switching those. Um, Penda has some folks have raised some eyebrows about that one, so we we did put that one out for some additional name considerations. Because I thought you were saying that Gum Springs it was a historically black area, so I, I was trying to figure out if, if that was. What would the objection be to leaving that there? Well, it it has to do with where the museum is and some folks um, feel that the entrance to gum springs is at fortson and others feel that it's at a different location so it's it's mo mostly it came up from the gum springs community itself and uh, they wanted us to reconsider the naming but um, I don't think the only thing that that I heard objection over was I think Sherwood Hall, which we were considering as a name anyways for any of the stations. And we took our names from the comp plan. That's you know what, what they currently show in the comp plan, the embark plan. OK. Um, the, the the lanes, of, I guess it's mostly right lanes that uh, I saw up here that were disappearing. Um, are those in those cases, are those existing right turn lanes or were these in the design and then they were pulled? In, in most cases, they were in the design. Okay. Um, I'd have to look at case by case as to whether there's existing right turn lanes there today. I think the reason I asked is that, that I know you, I think you, you, you've done, I mean, this is an incredible project. Um, and I know you, you, the outreach has also uh, been intense. I just didn't want, uh, you know, when it's when it's constructed, that you you have from riders a WTF moment. What happened to this lane? But it doesn't sound like that because it wasn't there to begin with. This was something uh, in the design only, and then you then you pulled it from the design. If, if I heard you correctly. Yeah, so the the entire corridor is going to be as essentially getting a makeover. So even if there is an existing right turn lane, there aren't particularly in the the V dot administered piece where we're widening. There aren't three lanes in each direction today, so it's going to be a completely different roadway when people enter it. Uh, um, and actually taking away a lot of the right turn lanes makes it actually a more consistent corridor because through most of the corridor, even the original design did not have 
many of the right turn lanes. Well, I don't think you have a more, uh, I don't want to say advocate, but more informed uh, 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 public member than our vice chair. And he's uh, he's done a good job of keeping us up to speed on it. So uh, well done, uh, Pete. Oh. Well, if, if you don't, thank you for that. But uh, any more questions? Hearing none, I, uh, just a couple comments for me. One, thank you very much for being here tonight. Um, it's always good to learn where we where we are now. Uh, one thing we didn't talk much about is uh, the acquisitions. I know they're ongoing, but uh, I think uh, one of your people, Rick Ricky Foley, is there. Um, uh, could he give us a, a thumbnail on how the acquisitions are going? Because that's a, a big thing that causes delays. Uh, yes, the acquisitions are currently on schedule. Uh, we have currently acquired five properties um, on the acquisition plan. Uh, we're largely in the whole parcel acquisitions right now, which are uh, total about 40. Uh, as I just stated, we've acquired five uh, of which we have a few more that we're getting ready to, I think, uh, put under contract soon. Um, and then relocations uh, start shortly underway after we acquire the properties. So we work on uh, relocating the landowners, tenants, et cetera, uh, through the process. Additionally, uh, one of the acquisitions was the Alexandria Motel, which is now being uh, demolished as we sort of speak. Uh, the demolition started Monday, and um, that exercise is ongoing and should be completed uh, early December. Okay. Well, you, say, you say, say you're on schedule, but at one point uh, I had heard someone uh, in acquisitions lamenting that you didn't have enough people to get the job done in the in the time frame that you wanted to get it done. Has it has that been corrected? We have bought on a, a number of additional resources through our consultant to help support the acquisition process. Uh, there was a lot of concern, uh, perhaps, but uh, I don't think at any point we were understaffed at, at the time of um, uh, perhaps that statement. Uh, but there was just concerns about being able to staff up when that was appropriate. Uh, one of the, I know one of the the uh, concerns was with the appraisal process and getting qualified appraisers. Uh, we have addressed that issue, though. Perfect. Thank you. Um, just a general comment um, for anybody that that cares what what we saw tonight as far as the total project, and especially in, in my mind, uh, the changes in the, the turn lane analysis. Um, as far as I know, that's the first time uh, BDOT has ever gone to the, such great steps to uh, listen to the public and react to the public and to change the design uh, based on the emphasis on pedestrian and bicycles um, and trying to make this place uh, more livable. And I, for one, commend you guys um, for doing that. Uh, the 35 mile an hour speed design, uh, it, it helps a lot because you can narrow lanes, you can uh, make, make turns more of a right hand turn so that you can make intersections smaller. Um, just, I could go on for a long time, but I truly appreciate um, the work you guys have done to make this massive design a little bit more walkable and more of a destination. I appreciate it. Uh, and I know the citizens do too. Um, any, anything else, gentlemen? I had two quick ones. Uh, what, what's the, the projected completion date and, and what, what is the uh, expected speed of the, of the buses on the BRT? Well, the completion date is uh, around 2030. Ooh. Somewhere around that time frame, it could be a little longer, it could be a little shorter. Uh, the operating speed of the buses we've discussed. Um, well, initially we modeled them for 45. <clears throat> that was the posted speed, and <clears throat> the speed limit is being lowered to 35. We may consider running the buses at a higher speed, but we haven't uh, made that final decision yet. 
OK, all right. Thank you for that presentation, and I, 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 I really am interested in this project and, a, and I'm very much in favor of the BRT, so I, I wish you luck uh, bringing it bringing it home. Thank you. Well, thanks again, AJ and, and Dan uh, and Rick for coming in. I appreciate it. Um, and if and if you have nothing else for us, uh, we'll just thank you again and say go home yeah, or stick around if you want to give you the same offer we gave to the first group. Thanks for having thank us, Pete. Thank you very thank much. You very much. OK, well, we're running a little little behind, but, but that was definitely interesting. Um, we're supposed to discuss the agenda for the joint meeting with the Board of Supervisors. Uh, and if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just speed up and if anybody wants to uh, comment, please do. Otherwise, I'm going to try to roll through a little bit of this. Uh, at this point, Mike and I, and we believe Tom Bashani is leaning in uh, to agree with us, that the topic would be about alternate uh, modes of uh, evaluation on roadways. Because they're going to be presenting those that that information to the, the board transportation in uh, December 13th, at, but only at a very high level um, approach uh, because they don't have details. Basically, they, they've looked at 60 or so different alternate modes of evaluation and they've thinned out it a lot, but they have not finalized. But they they have a good idea of where they're going. Um, so that's probably going to be what we use as our our main talk, talking point when we meet with the board of supervisors. Um, I, I just think it's it, it, and I, I'm pretty sure I've said this to Mike before, but it, you know it, it just seems like such a technical topic for our first uh, joint meeting. Uh, but you know, so be it. But I also think uh, weren't we talking about some type of tutorial or something before we did this for the TAC? On yeah, and that's that comes. My second thing is uh, tentatively um, on December 20th, we'll get that uh, tutorial um, from FC DOT at our December 20th meeting. OK, OK. I got ahead of you. Thank you. No problem. You, you let me go into that one. <laughs> OK, um, let's see. The 2021 TAC Award, you were there, Kevin, and I appreciate you being there, and so was Calvin. Um, I, I think that the, the people were very happy to receive the, the award. Uh, things went pretty well. I mean, vice chair didn't do you know as great as chair, but he did OK, I think. No, and, you did fine. But, but I forgot, just like our chair did, to mention that was Kevin in the room. So uh, we have to put that into our agendas when we write these things. Say, look around and go, who's here? Because I should have said that for him and for Calvin, but I didn't. So I, my apologies. Or at um, least you didn't say, my God, how did Kevin get here this early in the day? But <laughs> there you go. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, after the, the ceremony, we got to Kevin uh, a letter requesting that we recognize someone who w was not able to attend uh, and wasn't you know, maybe properly documented in, in the, the, the write-up that they gave us, um, but he passed away. His name is David Humphrey, and uh, I think the TAC will agree with this. Uh, what we've agreed to do, Kevin and I um, have agreed that if they write some sort of letter um, and give it to us, we will put it on our stationery and send it to his widow, uh, thanking him for his service. And, and just to clarify, I, I don't know whether he was a resident. I, I was a little bit surprised by the request, so I don't know what initiated it. From my supervisor's office, but I was, you know, happy to pass it on and accommodate. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if he was a Braddock resident and that's what drove it or, or what. But um, the draft has come back. And okay. Was, um, I thought maybe you were copying on it. If you weren't, I could send it to you. 
but there was also room for a co-signature for, for, for Walkinshaw. So I sent a message to um, his chief of staff asking if if he wanted to co-sign the letter with the with the chair. So I've not heard back on that. OK, but uh, it, without objection, uh, uh, we'll do that uh, and send that letter. If anybody objects, no. Good. Thank you. Um, couple things we have to have our work plan uh, in by March 1st or April. So um, meeting in person for uh, December, it's probably not something we should do because we're still technically under a state of emergency by the Board of Supervisors. And if we meet in person uh, once, we may not be able to to come back and do our remotes anymore. So uh, I, I suggest that we have a meeting remotely in December and we save any any party uh, for when we frankly are made to go back and meet in person. So that's my two cents worth. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, just a FYI, Noel. Um, uh, through a meeting with Tom Bashadne has agreed to update the TAC uh, either by through the chair or vice chair or the whole TAC on a quarterly basis of what, what's going on in the county. We can kind of share with her what, what we're doing so that we can coordinate uh, what we, what, frankly, our schedule a little bit better. Um, and that's, that's my stuff. Um, let's see. Uh, it's public comment period, two minutes. I did see a face I didn't recognize, but I di didn't know if it was, uh, do we have anybody in the public? Going once, going twice? No, okay. Other business um, status of the TAC present, Presentation Achievement Award 2022. Um, has anybody received any? Because I have not. No, we have uh, we have not received anything. Um, we might have to uh, re-advertise us again. Okay. Well, the uh, um. Well, the, the deadline is in mid December, but so far there was like no interest. No. Okay. Now Tom Bashadi did say he would was thinking about nominating some group, but so far I have not seen that. The 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 Braddock. Supervisor's office, I think, was going to ask um, FCDOT to put the the Burke VRE trail, the, the latest one up that they just finished. Um, yep. So that may, but I that may be coming. Okay, and I did ask uh, uh, Tom Burke that was on. In fact, he may still be here at CTV um, to re. Put in the North Gateway work that they finished a couple like in 21 to put that back up there because that was a big project and a good one. That was yours for for Mount Vernon. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So he, he may re up it, but this time with more pictures. <laughs> yeah. The other one you nominated has that fallen out of the cycle? I think so. Okay. I think so. Yeah. Um, 23. TAC agenda topics, unless someone has anything else on that, I would just skip that this time. Because we're set for December, right? Where we have our meeting for December. Yep. We're okay. ready for December. Okay. Um, FC.monthly update. Calvin, do you have an, uh, an update for us? Um, I, I don't, but um, I believe that Tom said that he had something like a, a um, a report every six months to the board and and he will share that to us. And when yeah, I have no, that, he, I, I would uh, I would share that. It's every project in the county. Yes, thank you. I, I failed to put it in my notes, but uh, the FC dot gives a report to the Board of Supervisors every six months and he's going to share that with us when he does with them. So we'll, we'll get that from him. Plus, Noel will, uh, Noel will, uh, give us quarterly updates and discussions. So moving. Thank you, Calvin. And chair's report. I gave mine. Um, 
And with that, it's up to you good, good folks to give yours. So I'd like to call on Linda Sperling if she's here. I think she's left. Uh, Kevin, you got something else? Uh, I just mentioned that uh, we had the opportunity uh, with the uh, past chair, Jeff Parnes and myself uh, had met with um, former commissioner Frank Cohn, um, who lives at the Fairfax at Belvoir. And um, I think information has been put out previously that he served in World War II. Yes. Uh, he's, he's 97 years old, very active, very sharp, uh, just and a, and a great gentleman, just a pleasure to be with. And, and we're hoping to do it again. Um, he he's just has some fascinating stories from the war. I'd actually sent him a DVD, uh, a movie that I'd like, The Gallon Hours, which is actually a Navy film. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I thought all the DVDs came with subtitles these days, and they don't. And that's a little bit more difficult for uh, for Frank. So uh, if we have any audio visual specialists out there, uh, let me know. Uh, uh, how I could maybe procure another one with subtitles. I'd like to send it to you. The Library of Congress does a lot of that work. They might have one. Do they do they loan them out? I I, I believe they do. Okay. Maybe I'll look into that. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike, I don't think he's joined us. He, uh, Felicia Woods, she's not with us. Excuse me, she's not attending. She's not hasn't passed. Um, Roger, you got a report. I don't have anything to add tonight, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have no more report. Lee District vacant. Jeremy, you got something? I think Jeremy's left. Okay. Jeremy had Eric. to leave early. early. I think uh, Christy is here. How about Eric? Nothing significant to report. Thank you, sir. Um, David Skiles, not here. And Christy Garton, I don't see it. Oh, well, there's CG. Christy? Christy? Not hearing. Um, that, that ends our reports. Um, if there's nothing else, do I hear a motion to say goodnight? Would this be a possible campaign campaign platform next uh, next time around that our we have somebody that can run these meetings in two hours? <laughs> no offense, <laughs> Mike, if you're tuning in, but well done, well done, Mr. Vice Chair. Well, thank you, guys. And the three minutes here. Well, it's one so one I, hour longer than I'd like. <laughs> I, I I will I will assume your role and make a motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, we're done, good ge gentlemen, and have a good, safe month. And I guess we'll get together at the end of December and get smarter again. Right. So, uh, good program tonight. Good. Night. Well done. Nine. Good night, uh, good night all. Two minutes, two minutes to spare, Pete. Well done. Uh, thank you all. <laughs> good night. <laughs> good night, Calvin. Thanks, Calvin. Thanks, Glad you, you got your kid in time. Good night.